There once was a boss who was wondering why one of his most valued employees didn't show up for work. And he also didn't report in sick, because this guy was very responsible. And if, normally, if he was sick, he would call in, and he didn't. And one of this company's main computers was down. This valued employee was needed to work on it, so the boss calls the employee. And uh, uh, the, his cell phone, there comes a little voice that's whispering, Hello? And the boss realizes it's his employee's son. And he says, is your daddy there? Yes, whispers the little voice. And the boss says, can I talk to him? No. And he says, well, he's thinking, I'll I'll talk to the mom. Is your mother there? Yes. Can I talk to her? No. So now the boss is getting a little perturbed, and he's thinking, okay, there's got to be someone around that I can talk to. He says, is there anyone else there I can talk to? Yes, the policeman. And now the boss is going, what's the policeman doing at my employee's house? And he says, can I talk to him? No. And the boss says, why not? Because he's talking to mommy and daddy and the fireman. And now the boss is going, the fireman, he's getting a little alarmed, a little concerned. He says, well, well, why? And and as he's doing that, he's thinking he hears in the the background a helicopter. And he says, what's that sound? And the little boy says, it's a helicopter. He says, well, what's a helicopter doing there? Well, the search team has landed. And the boss says, the search team, what are they looking for? Who are they looking for? And with a whispering giggle, the little boy says, Me! (laughs) We all hear whispers in our lives. Sometimes they cause us to question. Sometimes they cause alarm and concern. Sometimes they're amusing and they cause joy. In your notes this morning, I want you to look at this statement. It says, There will always be whispers... And the very last sentence says, living in the abundant life requires listening to the right whispers because we are going to receive whispers from all kinds of people and all kinds of places. And I want to talk about whispers this morning. I want to welcome everyone who's in the house. Thank you for being with us. If you're back with us a second week, came back from Easter, hey, welcome back. It's good to have you here. We say you're only a guest once. After that, you're part of the family, so welcome to the family. Also, want to welcome our online audience. Good to have you with us today. Thanks for being with us. We're glad you've made us part of your Sunday experience. And if you're a first-time guest, we hope that you'll continue to join us on a regular basis. As we talk about whispers today, there are four places that whispers come from, and we're just going to dive right in. So if you're taking notes this morning, number one, where do whispers come from? They come from people. Whispers come from people. We're going to look at David. David heard whispers from from people. Some of those whispers were whispers of care and concern. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, And the setting for this is that David, uh, a few chapters earlier, had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And he brings Uriah back because Bathsheba tells him after a few weeks, hey, I'm pregnant. So David says, I've got to cover this up. He brings back her husband Uriah, who was a soldier, fighting on the front lines, brings him back to give him leave because he's thinking if he comes home, is with his wife, hey, Everyone's going to think it's his baby. But Uriah has this strong sense of duty and says, I shouldn't be relaxing. I shouldn't be with my wife. I shouldn't be sleeping in my bed, eating great food when the rest of my soldiers are out at war. He doesn't even go home. And as a result, David realizes my sin is going to be exposed. Everyone's going to know. So as a result, he sends Uriah back to the front lines with a message, put him on the front lines, pull back and let him be killed. That takes place, and Uriah is murdered. David marries Bathsheba after a short time of mourning, and the baby is born, and David thinks, everything's good, everything's fine. But God whispered to Nathan the prophet what David had done. 
Nobody else really knew what was going on, but God knew. And he whispered to Nathan. Nathan comes and confronts David and said, This baby that has been born is going to become sick and going to die. David begins to pray. He fasts. He stays up all night. He does this for an entire week. And at the end of the week, the baby dies. Let's pick it up in verse 18 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. It says, David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we tell him the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? These servants were concerned about David's well-being. They care about him, and they're whispering, what are we going to do? And David hears the whispers. It says in verse 19, when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived the child was dead. So he said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Sometimes as we hear people whisper about us, we hear the whispers of other people. It's because they love us. They're concerned about us. They care for us. They're looking out for our best. Those are good whispers to hear. Are you glad you have people that care about you? I hope everyone has someone that you care about. If you feel like you don't have anyone to care about you, I encourage you to become part of our family here at Radius. Get involved in a connect group. Help us to get to know you because we want to help you and we care about you because God cares about you. You matter to God. But not every whisper is a caring, loving whisper. Sometimes we encounter whispers of hatred, and David experienced that in the Psalms. We see in Psalm 41, verse 7, David writes, and he says, All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. In Psalm 31, 13, he talks about another time. He says, I hear many whispering terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my wife, my life. We need to be careful about what whispers we are listening to. There's times people whisper about us. They spread gossip, whether it's in the workplace or in the schoolyard, in the locker room. God forbid it be in the church, but you know I've been around long enough to know that there is gossip in the church, and there's whispers in the church, and it's not always pleasant, and it's not all, and it's not right. We should not be whispering about one another. But if we do hear those negative, discouraging, those whispers that are attacking us, whispers of hatred, we need to realize that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Don't let the negative whispers inspire fear and anxiety in your life. Because God is not the source of fear. Those whispers are from the devil. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, God says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. That word dismayed means to be broken down, to be beaten down, to be defeated. God says, Don't let anything beat you up, break you down, or defeat you. For I am your God, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's a lot of negative whispers in our society. You hear them on the news. You read them on the internet, on Facebook. Your enemies will give you whispers. Sometimes there are lies about you. Sometimes they're just undermining you and cutting you down. The whispers we hear, we need to guard our minds and guard our ears. When they're whispers of love and care and concern, those are okay. Sometimes there may be whispers of reproof. Someone says something to us trying to correct us. If they're doing it in the spirit of love, that's great. But if sometimes if there's people, they just have it out for you. They're trying to drive a knife into you and then you know just drive it in even further. Those are whispers. That's the devil is using to steal, kill, and destroy in our life. God wants us to have abundant life, and the whispers we listen to will either produce abundant life or steal the abundant life God has for us. So the first kind of whisper is whispers from 
people. Yes, all right? There's a second kind of whisper in your notes. Number two is self-talk. Self-talk. This is the things that we think to ourselves, the things that we say to ourselves, and maybe even the things that we say to God about ourselves. The prophet Elijah experienced this kind of whisper, and you can look at 1 Kings chapter 19 if you want. And the context of this is that just a a chapter earlier, Elijah was praying down fire. The prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Baal, gathered and had a sacrifice, and they're having a competition. Who's the real God? Prophets of Baal prayed all day, praying for Baal to send fire. Nothing happens. Elijah, in a prayer that takes less than a minute, has fire fall from heaven and consuming his sacrifice. And he went the extra mile. He doused it with tons of water, and the water was burned up. God showed up, gave him a great miracle, a supernatural miracle. And then Elijah, he says, we're going to get rid of these prophets of Baal, and he kills all 400. I mean, he's riding high. He's got a great victory. Woo! God's on the throne. Yeah, I am a powerful man of God. Look what God did. God is great. And then he hears the whisper of a woman. Now, I'm not going to make any commentary on that, okay? But Jezebel says, and actually it really wasn't a whisper. It was more of a shout. When I find him, I'm going to do to him what he did to my prophets. And now Elijah, he's flipping out. He's concerned. He takes off. He is running for his life. And he's discouraged. He's feeling lonely. And when you fast forward to verse 10, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. He's talking to God. They've torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they seek to take my life. You see, Elijah's thoughts were whispering to him, I am a committed Christian. I love God. I'm serving God with all I've got. But there's no one else there who does that. I'm the only one. I'm the only one who's loyal. And now they want to kill me. I'm all by myself. That's his self-talk. He's defeating himself. It's causing fear in his life. Instead of thinking about the great victory that God had accomplished, instead of thinking about how miraculous it was, and that same miraculous God could protect him from the queen, instead of remembering all of the faithfulness and the promises of God and the Word, He is allowing the negative self-talk to defeat him. He's all alone, all by himself. Elijah did not have a picture of God in his life. And that's how self-talk can be. It's kind of like a coin. A coin has heads or tails. And one moment, God's on the throne. The next moment, God's off the throne. One moment, God is good. The next moment, God doesn't care about me. He's bad. One moment, God loves me and he's watching out for me. The next moment, God has abandoned me. Our self-talk can flip on a dime, heads or tails, and we need to be careful what self-talk we allow into our life because our self-talk can produce abundant life or it can steal kill and destroy the abundant life the plans and purposes god has for us what's interesting is that elijah he wanted to give up he wanted to quit he says god take me to heaven now i'm done I don't want to do any more miracles. I don't want to speak your word. And I want you to think about this. If he was the only one in the nation who was standing up for God, is it a wise thing for God to take him to heaven so there's no more representatives speaking truth and trying to bring the nation back? No, not at all. So that's what self-talk does when we get into our flesh It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. But he's saying, God, take me to heaven. There's no one else here. He lost sight of the plans and purposes of God. And there may may be some of you here today, you've lost sight of the plans and purposes of God because something in life or someone in life has beaten you up and you've got fear, you're dismayed, you're beaten, you're broken down. 
friends, God is with you. He's your, at your right hand. He will help you. He is here, and he can help you today. You have a plan and a purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has works prepared for you and I. We are his workmanship. God has crafted us. What do you, God is a master. If the Bible calls him our master. What do you call a work that's made by a master? A masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a masterpiece. And say, thank you very much. You're a masterpiece and God has a work prepared for you. He has plans and purposes for you. Positive self-talk focuses on the plans and purposes of God, the promises of God, the love of God, God's care for you, the goodness of God. Part of our purpose is to help all people what? Find and follow Jesus. Jesus. Friends, when you're giving in a negative self-talk and you're saying, Man, life is horrible. God hates me. I'm all alone. I can't do anything. What happens? You can't. I mean, is that, if someone sees someone down in the molly grubs, are they going to want to follow Jesus if you're an Eeyore walking around? I remember Eeyore. We loved Winnie the Pooh as, um, when our kids were little. We watched it. You know, and Eeyore is walking around. Yeah, how are you today? All right. You know, there's the rain cloud falling over him. Yeah. You know, some of you remember Winnie the Pooh. And, and the thing, you know, it's, you know, has anything bad happened? No, but it probably will. You know, that was Eeyore. It's uh, some bad's going to happen. See, and he, his self-talk was negative. When we are Eeyores, no one's going to follow us to follow Jesus. And so the joy of the Lord is our strength, and that'll bring other people. What's, what is it about your life? How come you're always joyful, even in the bad times? Even when there's negative whispers going against you from other people, cutting you down for being a follower of Jesus, you're still joyful. You're kind. You're not bitter. You don't talk about revenge. You don't slander them behind your back. What's different about you when you and I are living God's way and God's life, Christ in us, and that is flowing through us, people will see that difference, and that will help them to become followers of Jesus. It'll help them to find and follow Jesus. So our self-talk is big. Positive self-talk focuses on God, His plans, His purposes, His care. Negative self-talk, it produces a world without God's help. God's not there. And we want to quit. We want to give up. But God never wants us to give up. Don't grow weary and well-doing for in due season. You will reap a harvest. So we've learned about two places whispers come. They come from people and they come from our self-talk. All right. Number three in your notes, the third place whispers come from is from the devil. Whispers come from the devil. Jesus encountered that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now self-talk and whispers, uh, self-talk and the whispers of the devil, they can seem very similar what is the difference between them? It's the pronoun. Self-talk, the pronoun is I. I'm all alone. I am the only one serving God. I can't do this. I'm not talented enough. I'm tired. I, I ha have to give up. I, 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 it's coming from you. But when the devil whispers, the pronoun is you. If you are the Son of God, prove it. Turn these stones into bread. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from the temple and the angels will protect you if you're really God's Son. 
they'll be there. If you're really God's son, or if you want all the kingdoms of the world, if you want this, just bow down to me right now, you, and I'll give you all the kingdoms and their glory. Well, Jesus knew that one day all the kingdoms would be his. Satan wanted him to take a shortcut. And that's what Satan says to us. You deserve better. You deserve this. You deserve that raise, that promotion. They didn't give it to you. So you should start embezzling money and get what's rightfully yours. Your spouse is not meeting your needs. You and that lady at work, that guy at work, showing you attention, looking real good. I mean, you deserve that. You deserve to have your needs met. The devil will speak in you. You're worthless. You're a bum. You're a loser. You're no one. You can't be used of God. When you hear you, realize that's the whisper of the devil. And there's two things, two ways the devil whispers to us. One is through temptation like what he did here with Jesus. Jesus, prove your identity. Sin, obey me, follow me, do what I say. And friends, what's interesting is when Jesus was tempted by the devil, every time he used one phrase, he said, it is written. What does that mean? It is written where? In the Bible. Jesus quoted scripture when he was being tempted by the devil. And if, when we're tempted, that's how we overcome temptation. That's why, one reason why it's so important for you and I to be reading our Bible every day. If you say, I don't know how to read my Bible, I don't know how to get anything out of it, you need to come to Growth Track. We'll teach you in Growth Track how to get something out of God's Word. But as you read God's Word, you'll know what it says. And so when there's a temptation that comes, you remember, I read something about that, and you can quote that Scripture. Better yet, if you know what temptations you're susceptible to, find Scriptures, you can, and Google's right now, Scriptures about lying, scriptures about jealousy, scriptures about lust, scriptures about anger. You can do that and you'll Google it and scriptures will come up. Find scriptures that you can use to combat the devil. What's also interesting is that after Jesus said it the first time, the next time the devil fired back with scripture. And a few weeks ago in our message about contradictions, we talked about how people will share Scripture out of context. They'll pull something out and use this to build their life on, to reinforce a belief or a practice that they're doing. And they say, see, I'm justified in God. But they've taken that out of context. And if you compare it to the rest of Scripture, then it doesn't line up. And so it's important. That's another reason for you and I to be in our Bibles, because if the devil does give us or someone else gives us a scripture out of context if we've been reading our bible we'd say wait a second that 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 doesn't sound right that doesn't line up with what i read last week the holy spirit will bring to remembrance the things that you've been reading and studying that's why it's so important for us to be in god's word it helps us to defeat temptation and it helps us to see when the devil or someone else is twisting scripture taking it out of context which would result in us losing out in the abundant life God has for us. So temptation is one way the devil whispers. There is another way he whispers, and that's through gossip. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but listen to what God says, uh, actually what Paul said through, uh, what God said through Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. So these are people, in their knowledge, in their mind, they rejected God. They, they are now depraved, and God says they are filled with all kinds of wickedness. There's, I mean, they're being demonically inspired. They are people that are influenced by evil forces. And then Paul goes on to list them. He explains what these people look like. He says the sexually immoral, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers. Other translations have translated that gossips. Someone once said that gossip is the devil's whisper that burns everything in its path through tongues untamed. 
Gossip is the devil's whispers that burn everything in its path through tongues untamed. Now, I've heard people say, I'm not gossiping. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. Here's the thing. Gossip isn't just telling a lie. You can tell the truth in gossip. Because the definition of gossip, and I believe we have it there in your notes, is gossip is sharing detrimental information with someone who's not part of the problem or solution. So if you share something negative with someone and they're not part of the problem and you're trying to resolve it, or they're not part of the solution, you're going to them to say, how do I resolve it? You've just gossiped. The devil whispered in your ear, you listen, and then you begin to whisper to others. Don't be a gossip. Because I have seen gossip destroy families and destroy churches. I've seen churches split over gossip. Gossip is one of the main ways the devil uses to keep Christians from experiencing abundant life and to keep churches from experiencing a revival, from being impactful in their community. Because if the Christians are backbiting and eating each other up, out in the community they're going to hear that because the gossip doesn't just stay inside the building. They'll gossip about each other outside the building. And when people hear that, it's like, why would I want to go there and be eaten alive by that bunch of piranhas? Gossip destroys our witness for Christ. So if you have a problem with someone, don't talk to someone else about it. Go and talk to the person about it. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 18. He said, if you've got a problem, go and talk to your brother one-on-one. -on -one. If that doesn't work, work, take two or three Christians with you as witnesses and try to resolve it. God wants us to resolve conflict instead of spread conflict. So those are two ways that the devil whispers to us. Now, let's look at the last way that we receive whispers, and those whispers are from God. God whispers to us. Going back to 1 Kings 19, we read about Elijah and his whisper of negative self-talk. That self-talk is coming through even as he's praying, and God responds to him now in verse 11. Let's pick it up there. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. I mean, does that feel like Wyoming sometimes in the wintertime? Yeah. God, my house is tearing apart. Anyway, a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. I'll say whisper in case the camera didn't pick it up. There came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, I find it interesting that the Almighty God the maker, the creator of heaven and earth, the king of kings and the Lord of lords did not show up in the wind that tore mountains apart. The Lord did not show up in the earthquake. The Lord did not show up in a raging fire. The Lord showed up in a whisper. That's how God talks to us in whispers. You say, what does that look like? The whispers of God and I believe we have them there in your notes. The whispers of God are, is when you're reading your Bible and you come to something and maybe you're discouraged and down and it encourages you. You're sad and there's a word that comforts you and makes you feel better. Or maybe you read something and God convicts you, you're doing something wrong, you're sinning, you need to get right, you need to confess it. Or maybe God shows you something that is right and you realize, man, I'm not doing that. I need to start doing that. God whispers to us through Scripture. That's one of the main ways He whispers through us to us. He also whispers to us when we're praying. Sometimes as we're praying, and we kind of did that here today, I encourage you in your own life, wait on God in silence. Just wait on God. 
Today we said, just listen for the whisper of God. What does God want to say to you? Maybe you need comfort, encouragement. Maybe you need direction for a decision. You wait on God and God can show you those things. He whispers to us in prayer. There's times I've been praying and I'll say, God, what do you want me to do today? Is there anything I need to say to my wife, to say to my daughter, to say to my kids? Is there anyone I'm going to come in contact with? And sometimes God lays a person's name on my heart and it's like, call them. Call so-and-so. Call your parents. Uh, you know, talk to your sister. Text someone. God will whisper to us as we're praying and we're asking him questions. It's okay to ask God questions. He'll speak to you. He'll give you promptings. He'll give you ideas. And it's always good to take those promptings and line them up with Scripture. I know one guy who divorced his wife because he said it makes me feel good and God is my father, a good father, makes his kids happy. I'm a child of God. This affair makes me happy, so this affair is good. Now, if he would have read the word of God, he would have realized what God has put together, let no one put asunder. He would have realized thou shalt not commit adultery. I wanted to say to him, well, are, does this affair make your kids happy? You know, are you a, being a good father right now? All promptings, all whispers from God should line up with Scripture. If it's something that's a gray area, and it's like you're feeling, God said go to Africa, I wouldn't sell everything you have, okay? I think it's good that you pray and say, God, you've got to give me confirmation about that. And you pray about it. Maybe go ask some trusted advisors when you hear some whispers that you're unsure about. Ask mature Christians. Ask your pastor. Ask people that know you. People that have handed the whispers and promptings of God properly that you know that they are pretty accurate when it comes to hearing from God. It's not something that's, Woo! God wants to be practical. Christ lives in you. He wants a relationship. You have a relationship with someone, they talk to you. God wants to talk to us. God also whispers to us. Sometimes, maybe you're in a store and you see someone looking distraught and God just nudges you and says, ask if everything is all right. It's like, really God? You want me to do that? And then you just ask and you see what happens and God might give you an opportunity to pray for them. Or if someone's sick and God says, Pray for them. They're sick. God might nudge you to pray for someone. We've talked about in a couple of weeks, we're having our missions, uh, spring, our spring missions emphasis. We're going to receive faith promises. Our faith promises go to support the missionaries that you see on the back wall. That's how they live on the field. That's how they stay there. That couple that were raising the money for the Jumpstart Project, they're there in that Muslim country because of faith promises. We're asking you the next two weeks to say, God, how much do you want me to give? And just pray and say, God, give me a figure. How much a week? How much a month? What do you want me to give to help missionaries go around the world? God speaks to us in whispers. There's a final whisper God gives, and that's called a word of knowledge. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and that's when God gives you specific knowledge, maybe about a person, a place, a time, about details of someone's life, and it's kind of scary. A few years ago, some of you may remember, we had Tim Enlow, an evangelist here. And Tim was sharing how his, uh, his diesel truck was broke down and a mechanic was working on it. And as he's working on it, God gave Tim a lady's name, the name of a hotel, and the time. And he had this impression that this mechanic, when he was done working on the truck, he was meeting with this lady that night to have an affair. And so as the mechanic is working underneath the truck, he says, does the name, and he mentioned the name, at 8 o'clock at such and such hotel mean anything to you? Wham! The guy hits his head on the bottom of the truck, slides out, white as a sheet. How did you know that? And as Tim, he says, God just gave it to me. He says, I was going there to meet this lady for the first time to have an affair. We'd been talking online. I was going to cheat on my wife. God used that word of wisdom to bring that guy to repentance. He never went. He broke the affair off. God can speak like that. I know it's a little unusual. You say, boy, that's kind of scary. How do I know? Well, how does a baby start walking? You just start walking. 
God wants to whisper to us. Whispers that give us direction, whispers that give us comfort, that give us encouragement, that help us in our walk with God and that help other people in their walk with God. And that's what took place in verse 14. God whispered directions to Elijah, a guy who's ready to give up, a guy who's ready to quit, a guy who says, I'm all alone, there's no one else. This is what God whispered to him. And actually, we'll, we'll pick it up where, you know, kind of repeating what Elijah said. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Verse 15, the Lord said, go back the way you came. You want me to go back where that lady's trying to kill me? Are you kidding me? Go back, all right? And... Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as a prophet. God is saying, I'm going to give you a young man for you to mentor. A partner. Batman, you're now going to get your Robin, okay? You're not going to be the Lone Ranger anymore. You're going to have a partner who is there to carry the burden and the load with you. He's going to succeed you. Verse 17, Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael. And he's talking about people that were rebelling against God. Elisha will put to get death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. The final thing God says, Elijah, you're not alone. You're not alone. I'm with you. I care for you. I've been with you. I've empowered you in the past. I'm going to empower you in the future to anoint leaders that are going to accomplish my purposes, to anoint someone else to become a prophet, to continue your work. I'm not done with you. You're not through. Keep going. Never give up. But he said it all in a whisper. What's interesting, from the time this chapter began in verse 1 to the time it ends, 41 days had expired. 41 days. You see, not always does God give the answer immediately as soon as we go to Him with the question. Not always does God give us what we want to hear when we want to hear it. There once was a young man who lost his job and he had been looking for employment for a, quite a long time and he found nothing. And he goes to an old pastor that he knew and he comes to his office and he says, I don't get it. I'm praying. I'm following God. I've got nothing. Why, why is God doing that? And the old preacher responds in a, a hushed tone and the young man couldn't hear what he said so he moved a little closer. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. And the pastor replies again in a hushed tone. And the guy says, I can't hear you. Well, what are you saying? And he gets closer and the pastor keeps speaking softly. So the guy gets over to him. So we're now they're head to head. And the pastor says to him, sometimes God whispers to us so that we'll close the distance and draw closer to him. And that's why you haven't heard from God, because God is wanting to bring you close to Him. My friends, you might be here today, and maybe you've been shouting to God, maybe you've been whispering, maybe you've been saying, God, why? I'm all alone. God, I'm tired. I give up. God, I quit. God, you don't care about me anymore. God, I can't do anything anymore for you. Don't give up. Even if God hasn't spoken just draw closer to Him. Seek the answer, not a answer. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He's your answer. You need Jesus more than you need anything Jesus can say to you. Yes, He wants to speak to you, but more than that, Jesus wants a relationship with you.
Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much this morning that you know what every person in this room needs and every person who's watching online, you know what they need today, Father. I pray that you would whisper just the right thing to every person. Help us to hear your voice and obey. This morning I ask, what is the whisper that you need to hear? Do you need to hear a whisper from God that he loves you? That you matter, that he cares, that he's watching over you? Maybe you're discouraged and you need encouragement today. Maybe you've even had a great victory, but then you got bad news and you've kind of just lost all faith in God. God wants to give you a whisper of encouragement today. Maybe you're here and you need a whisper of comfort. You're hurting. You've been wounded. Maybe it's been whispers of the devil that are saying you're worthless. You're not worth anything. Or maybe it's been whispers of gossip that have been coming from other people, been attacking you. And you feel that you're all alone and you need a comfort, comforting word from the Lord. Jesus can comfort you today. Maybe you're here and you've got a decision. You, you need direction from God. God, I don't know what to do. There might be others of you. God is convicting you. He's whispered, you're in sin. You need to get right with me. Turn away. Get right. Whatever it is. Maybe God has spoken some of you a whisper. You know what it is. And it's like, man, I don't want to do it. God, I'm scared. God, I, I'm afraid what's going to happen. Or, God, I just don't want to give it up. I'm afraid what I'm going to lose. I don't feel like doing that. And some of you have a whisper that you need to obey. If you're here this morning or you're watching us online and you'd say, I need a whisper from God or God's given me a whisper that I need to obey, I need to follow, would you just lift your hand saying, I need to hear from God today. I need a ha an answer, encouragement, comfort, direction. I need to repent. I need to obey him. I need to follow. Just put your hand up high. I want to pray for you this morning. If you're watching us online and that's you, just raise your hand right now. God sees. He knows what that need is. Lord, as every hand is raised, you see what's behind it. For some, there have been sleepless nights filled with tears. For some, there have been shouts. Why, God, why? Why? And maybe they've shouted so much they've become hoarse and it turned into a whisper. Lord, for some, they've got questions. What do I do? God, I need a job. What decision? God, how do I pay for college? How do I pay all these bills? How do I get out of debt? Lord, you know the need. And I pray today that your peace that surpasses understanding would guard every heart and mind. God, you would answer the prayer. You would speak to them. God, give them the strength to endure as they're waiting for the answer. Help them to draw close to you and not to pull away, not to be bitter or resentful if they're not hearing you talk. Whisper to them right now, I've got you. In fact, I believe God wants you to know, my beloved, you're in my hands. You've never left my hands. I'm taking care of you. In fact, I am carrying you. You maybe don't feel it, but I am here. I am near. Trust me. Lay down your worries, your fears, your problems. Because I am your God. I love you. And I have heard you. And I will answer you in due time. Father, I thank you for that whisper, that word that people needed to hear. I thank you for that whisper you gave earlier in our service about refreshing us. I pray for that renewing and that refreshing to go through us, to carry us through the week, God. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, the last words he echoed, and maybe they were a whisper. I kind of think they were a a hoarse whisper because he gave everything. He'd been hanging on the cross for hours. He had been so beaten and marred that 
The Bible says his image was distorted. You could even tell he was a human being. And the last words Christ whispered was, It is finished. He was talking about the payment for our sin. The wages of sin is death. And when he said those words, he gave his life. He paid the full price for our sin so that we could have a relationship with God. And there are some of you here this morning, live in the house and those watching online, that you have never given your life to Christ. You've never confessed your sin. You don't have a relationship with God. You don't hear God talking to you because your sin is separating you from God. But maybe throughout the worship today, you felt something drawing you. Maybe throughout the message, you felt kind of a tug on your heart. God drawing you to Him. And you know today that you need to get right with God. You need to ask God to forgive you. He loves you. Jesus died for your sin. He took the penalty so you and I don't have to die and spend eternity in hell. Christ wants to give us eternal life. And if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, if you say, God, I need to confess my sin, I need to surrender to my life to you as Lord, that you're in the house or online, I'd like you to raise your hand right now. Say, God, please forgive me. God, save me from my sin. God, I want a relationship with you. Just put your hand up right now. Thank you. I see that hand in the middle. Anyone else this morning? Anyone else today? You'd say, that's me. I want to get right with God. For those who are watching with us in the live stream, if God's tugging on your heart, just go ahead and put your hand up. Say, God, I'm coming to you. I want to run back to you. I love you, God. I want a relationship with you. Anyone else, you'd say, I need a relationship with God. I need Jesus to become my forgiver and my leader. Just put your hand up, then you can put it back down. I want to pray with you. I'd like all of us to say this prayer together. Lord God, Please forgive me. You love me so much that you gave your son to die for my sin. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I surrender my life. Become my leader. I will follow your path. Give me a new life. And help me to hear your whispers. To walk with you forever. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me and dying for me. Amen. Amen. For those of you who said that prayer, I want to welcome you to God's family. And I encourage you to do one of two things. First, there is a card in front of you. And it says, welcome. I want you to fill that out. And halfway down, there is a box that says, I received Christ today. I want you to check that box. And as soon as we're done, when you go to the lobby, before you get cookies and coffee, there is a table there with the welcome banner and the welcome boxes. I want you to turn that card in. We have a book that's going to help you grow in that relationship. The other thing is we have a class. It's called Growth Track, 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. You can come next Sunday morning. It's in the library. You walk in the doors. It's right to the right. And go to Growth Track, and that will help you to grow.